1 Corinthians. Uh, last week, Pastor Miguel covered the first nine verses, and this was the welcome. Uh, Paul was saying, hey, uh, good to talk to you again. I bless you in the name of the Father. Um, and uh, he, Miguel also covered uh, some of the context, and we'll get even deeper into context this week, uh, but he covered most of the majority of the context. Um, and verse 10 uh, through 17 is where we're going to be at. And so, like I said, Paul, he, he welcomes them and he says, hey, I'm writing this letter. I praise God for you. Uh, but one thing we need to understand is Paul planted this church, okay? And so he, he spent a year and a half there. Um, and it's been about five years since he's been back. And so although he is writing a letter to say, hey, good to see you, I miss you, he's also about to rebuke them hard. Uh, Paul is a loving father in this situation, and his kids are acting whack, okay? Um, and if you are like me, you have some children, <laughs> or maybe you've had children in your life. Um, but the reality is, is we've all approached a two-year-old who just wants to do his own thing. Uh, And we're like, stop, okay? Just relax for a second. Just hear me out, okay? Uh, And so that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, And I just wanted to encourage you all. I I had the most adult moment this weekend. Before we get into the word, I was, my wife and I, we have a dog, love her to death. Um, But she eats things. And so we got this vibration caller to like humanely tell her no. Um, And... uh, (laughs) She eats our vacuum cord, and I was so upset. I was like, and shampooer, (laughs) wife, thank you. Uh, And so, like, my wife is like, oh, get rid of this dog. And I'm like, I know, like, we'll we'll figure it out. But I had the most adult moment because the new new, uh, vacuum shows up in the mail to our door from Amazon. Wow, I said the mail. How, what? Um, Anywho, uh, Amazon shows up, delivers a vacuum. And man, we plugged this thing in, and I was like, oh, a new vacuum. It's just, you know, you see that carpet pull up, and you're like, man, this is clean. So I had a really adult moment this week. Uh, But anywho, so let's read through 1 Corinthians 10 through 17, and then we're going to break it down a little bit. I'm going to exegete the text and kind of just line by line look at things um, and show us some context. So let's look at verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. My brothers, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I, that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. And he mentions, hey, I did baptize this household, forgot about them. Uh, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be empty of its power. Wow. Wow. Okay, pretty simple here. There's some divisions in the church. But there's a pretty important theological statement that I just want to upfront address. Uh, I don't know what you've been taught in all walks of life, walk through these doors. Uh, here at Lighthouse, uh, we want you to understand that it is not salvific uh, for you to be baptized. It is an important decision in your life as a symbol to follow Jesus, to go down with the old and up with the new, just as Jesus Jesus did in resurrection for you. Um, But Paul clearly, as a disciple of Jesus, would be speaking heresy uh, if if the truth was baptism was salvific, uh, because he says, I thank God that I baptize none of you. Um, and so just to be clear, if you've ever theologically ran into that or had that, uh, had that encounter, um, baptism is not uh, essential to salvation. Um, but grace of God and faith in Jesus is. Uh, so the first line I want to look at, just let's read verse 10 again, uh, and we'll, we'll get into it here. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. 
So Paul's being very intentional here in the language that he's using as he's addressing everyone. So that first line, I appeal to you, brothers. And like I said, Paul is a loving father in this situation, but he's, he's rebuking his children, essentially. Um, he's saying, hey, I'm going to lovingly come aside, alongside of you uh, at, to appeal to you to say, I got some very harsh truths for you. Uh, the reality is, is the church of Corinth is not looking pretty. Uh, the whole emphasis of 1 Corinthians is Paul saying, you look way too much like the world and not like the church of Christ. And so he's saying, this is my first rebuke to you, but I'm going to be a loving father in this situation and, and speak to you kindly, but I'm also going to have authority in my voice when I speak to you. I'm not going to raise my voice, but I'm going to speak to you plainly. Uh, and so what's clearly happening is there's divisions and he's calling them upward, and he's calling them to unity. But again, Paul is using very specific language here. So the Greek for divisions is not just like, hey, we're fighting and we're upset. No, divisions is the, the Greek word schismata, which is where we get the word schism, which, which means to tear apart. It means that they're ripping each other apart with their opinions and, and, and ideal, ideologies, it means that these Bible-believing, loving brothers and sisters are getting together and they're hating each other. They're ripping each other apart. And Paul says, hey, that's contrary to the gospel. That's contrary to the Jesus you follow. So let's keep reading and finish this out and then we'll, we'll get into deeper. Uh, verse 11 again, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brother. So this is Paul just saying, hey, heard it through the grapevine, uh, good sources. Uh, the fact that I'm hearing about this, like I'm hearing it across, uh, like they didn't have phones, right? No, Chloe had to travel and go, hey, Paul, your church is whack. Uh, and so what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And we'll get into what that means. And he says again, to, to, to just cap it off, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you may say that you were baptized in my name. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, let the cross be emptied of its power." You know, this is interesting because Paul is actually addressing two kind of uh, two divisions happening. Uh, there's the ripping of uh, each other apart, and he's also talking about quarrels, right? He says, what are, you, what are you saying? Like, hey, you're saying I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. And, and so there's a difference here, divisions and quarrels. And the first one I want to look at is quarrels. What's a quarrel, right? It's a fight. Right, uh, the the Webster defines it as a, a, a heated argument or disagreement, typically about a trivial issue and between people who are usually on good terms. James four verse one says it like this: What what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It is not this that your passions is it not this that your passions are at war within you. It's a very important distinction because the reality is quarrels will happen; they're normal. In life, right? We have friends, siblings, spouses. And all the spouses in the room said, hey, I know about that. Um, but, but here's the important distinction. Quarrels can lead to division. So what can seem like a good-hearted fight that's just, hey, I'm le I, I, we, we're just debating over this thing and, you know, uh, maybe it's a theological issue. Maybe your friends are debating about whether Chick-fil-A or Popeye's chicken sandwich is the best. If you don't solve that, quarrels lead to division. And so quarrels are an important part of the conversation. Fights, so to speak, are an important part of the conversation. And he's, he's talking about this part where he says, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Cephas. And so what, what does that look like? Well, the reality is, is Paul is an apostle of Christ. He's a disciple. He walked with Jesus. Apollos is a wizard with his words. He's a theologian. 
And so he's come to the church of Corinth and taken over pastoral leadership, and he's been preaching. And you've got some camps who, who say, man, I really love this Apollos guy. Like, he's just really calm. You know, Paul was really aggressive. He got in my face, and he, like, he punched me in the face with a word. And, and Apollos, he's just really kind, and he really, he's a wordsmith. And, you know, Cephas, uh, that, that's Simon Peter. And so, you know, he walked with Jesus too. But, you know, we got the most holy of holies, those who say, I follow Christ. I follow Christ, not those guys. And the reality is, guys, this happens in our church. It happens in two ways. Number one is we create celebrity pastor culture. We create camps out of, oh, I listen to Stephen Furtick. I listen to Mike Todd. I, no, 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 no. I listen to John MacArthur. No, no, no. No, I listen to John Calvin. No, no, no. I'm, I, I believe in free will. I believe in Cal, Calvin. Whatever it is, we create camps. And we say, you know what? I'm better, you know, because, you know, John MacArthur, man, he may be a cessationist, but, man, he knows how to talk about marriage. Ooh, are we sure about that? Are we sure that Stephen Furtick's inspirational messages are always the best for us? Are we sure that Mike Todd sitting in a boat on a, on a stage full of water is the best for us. I'm not here to say that that is what, what we're doing, but what I am here to say is, is that this can cause divisions in the church because you're like, this preacher's the best. No, what's the best? The word of God. Let's make sure whoever, whatever pastor we're listening to is first loyal and faithful to the word of God. And the second way we see this in, in our churches is, is denominations. Um, and for some of you, this might be a good experience, a bad experience, but the reality is, is I'm not saying denominations are a bad thing. I think, I think actually denominations are a beautiful thing when they're used rightly, uh, that we can create different expressions of worship and preaching and, 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 and sacraments, and people all around the world can find home and a sense of family and churches, and they go, man, we, we all kind of do the same thing. Let's link up. That's a beautiful thing, but the reality is the large vast majority of denominations have been created out of church splits over theological doctrine that is not even foundational. See, here's the problem. We're debating over secondary and tertiary third issues of the gospel that aren't even the fact of salvation. And the reality is we've created denominations based on whether you speak tongues or not. We've created denominations on whether you should submit to your husband and wife a certain way or not. What are we talking about? That's not the bride together. That's not the spotless, lamb, the spotless bride for the Lamb of God. That's, that's churches divided. And the reality is that seeps in. Because what's, what's true, friends, is we all walk in with different, different ways of life. We all walk in knowing that We've experienced, experienced different things, whether we, we've walked through hurt or trauma or we've, we've seen certain social issues in our life that we think are more important than others or, or we've had just certain experiences and we say, no, these are the most important things. And Paul is reminding them, let there be no divisions among you. And does that mean we can't disagree? No, not at all. What it means is, what he says is that I pray that you're all of the same mind and same judgment. And what he's saying here is there's foundational truths of the gospel that you're splitting over. And that's why there's a tearing apart. That's why there's a ripping apart. He's saying, I appeal to the, the Jesus you follow, you're ripping each other apart over. And the truths that you should follow you're, you're ripping those apart. I want to give some deeper context to what's ha- happening because people don't just like fight and punch each other in the face for no reason. <laughs> Not This isn't literally what's happening, but if, if the language is so strong that it's ripping apart, there's a reason for it. Well, So the church of Corinth is in the city of Corinth, and the reality is is that before Paul got to Corinth, it had laid waste for 100 years. And so in 44 AD, 
uh, Julius Caesar had some ex-military and ex-generals that were retiring from the army, but they were ambitious. And so most likely ambitious military were going to go after government, i.e. Julius Caesar. And he knew, number one, these guys were smart. They were, they were well-crafted in warfare. And so the reality is, is he said, I want you gone. Uh, and so because Corinth had laid to waste for over 100 years, he said, hey, guys, there's this port city. It used to make a ton of money. There was so much traffic. I'm going to go ahead and gift you some land and I'm going to gift you some slaves. I want you to go rebuild the city, have fun, go make tons of money, and just go buck wild. And so all these ex-military generals and, and ex-military men take their, their, their piece of land and slaves, and they go off to Corinth. And so these military men made deals with the slaves, and they said, help us rebuild the city, and we'll give you our freedom. And we'll give you your freedom. And so... What you have here is a port city that's been rebuilt, tons of traffic with sailors. So you got sailors, ex-military, and now ex-slaves. And that's a strong cocktail. And if you have one of those, you better not drive, okay? (laughs) Um, So this is why we talk about Corinth in the way of like, it's the new, it's the old Las Vegas. It's like, there is so much going on. There is so much just ways of life who want to just do it their way. And man, we, we come from the sea and we're, we're rough and rowdy. And you've got these ex-military men who have been under government law their whole life. And they're like, we're going to do it our way and we're rich. And then you have slaves who are free. Slaves who find freedom are going to go free. They're going to do what they want to do. And then Paul says, I'm going to put a church in there. <laughs> Woo! Talk about an undertaking. Wow. But that makes sense now. So why are there divisions? Well, if you've ever lived in inner city, if you've ever lived outside of a a suburbia, or like I I used to go to New York City when I lived in New York, you start to see that a melting pot of lifestyles creates quite a mess at times. It can create some beautiful food. (laughs) But ways of life, and when you're talking about morality standards, it, it can create some wayward ways. And, and so all these different lives, uh, walks of life and their living styles, uh, and let's not fool ourselves either. This, this is happening in the room right now. Yeah. We, and this, this is a good and bad thing. Uh, we all have different interpretations. We all have different political I- ideologies, like I said, and social issues. And Paul, what he's saying is, despite that not all of us would be friends, okay, agree, be of the same mind. Foundational truths of Jesus, they bring us together. Jesus is the common denominator. We're we're all in this room for one reason. Jesus is the common denominator. And so be of the same mind. And Again, guys, this is not a cry only to the church of Corinth for Paul, but this is a cry to ourselves daily. It's hard. It's hard because our flesh and our selfishness and pride doesn't want to doesn't be agreeing, uh, agreeing on the same things. We don't want to have the same mind on things. Guys, there is an adversary against the whole C church. His name is Satan, and his goal is to create disunity. And so when Paul says, be of the same mind, man, that, that is tough because we have selfish pride. We have, we have flesh in us. And so what, what's the opposite of division that I think Paul is calling the church to? It's reconciliation. So if we're divided, the heart of the Father is then that we come together that we be united and perfectly joined. And if there's tearing and ripping apart, and relationally there is people who are fighting and after one another and there's hatred, that means we must be reconciled. And if you know anything about reconciliation, that takes work. Reconciliation is a two-way street. Uh, A month ago, uh, I went on a retreat retreat to uh, Kansas City 
um, and I attended the uh, well-known uh, IHOP International House of Prayer. Um, <laughs> yeah, not, not the International House of Pancakes. Uh, that, that's a bummer if you go there. Um, <laughs> but sorry to all the IHOP lovers, sorry. Um, but anywho, I go to the International House of Prayer, and, and I'm on this retreat with, with songwriters. And, and uh, it had been a long week. Uh, it had turned from a songwriting retreat to the Holy Spirit doing a lot of work in all these pe- messed up people's lives. Um, and the night before, uh, I had gone to the, up, uh, the house of prayer. We had had a prophetic ministry time over each other, and, and we spent like three hours in prayer and getting words. And I love, I love being in the Spirit. I love just, you know, spending a lot of time with the Lord and all that. But sometimes, you know, I just need a second, you know, with the swirlies and the ooh-wah-wahs and the Lord is saying this and all that. I love it. But I, sometimes I just need to come back to reality just for a second. You just ground my feet. Um, and just get my emotional tolerance back up. <laughs> and, and so that had happened the whole night. Like, we were up till 1 a.m. praying. And, and then we wake up, and it's like 7 in the morning, have breakfast, and then go to the house of prayer. And I've been telling the Lord on the way, you know, I'm just excited to, like, just rest. I'm just excited to, you know, this is going to be, uh, you know, a great, uh, they just play worship. Nobody's on stage telling us what to do. They just read scripture verses, and uh, they worship. And, you know, the bands are always good. I've watched the live stream. I'm, just, I'm so thankful. I'm just going to sit down, and I'm going to relax. And I'm just going to I'm just going to chill, have a cup of coffee. And, uh, yeah, that didn't happen. Um, so I walk in, and I'm greeted. Uh, let's say his name is Frank. I don't remember his name. I'm greeted by the welcome, and I shake his hand. Hey, nice to meet you. He's like, what's your name, Sam? He just looks at me and he's like, man, Sam, I, I think the Lord's giving me a word for you. I was like, Lord, are we serious? Like, I need a break. <laughs> and so he goes on like a five-minute thing. Man, he hits it on the head. And I'm like, okay, awesome. I'm going to test those words. Thank you so much for loving me. I was like, I need to get a cup of coffee. I just need to go in the prayer room. And he's like, yeah, I totally understand. And so I go in the prayer room. I'm like, all right, here we go. I got my cup of coffee. And they're praying, and they're praying through Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And they get to the part where it talks about the Lord prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. Um, because, guys, I've had some divisions in my life. I've had some, some relationships that, that haven't worked out so well that need reconciliation. And I, I'm not totally sure what those look like. And I've been, I've been carrying the load of that. And I'm like, Lord, what do I do? And I haven't really come to him much. And I hear that phrase, and all of a sudden the Spirit checks me. He's like, all right, we're going we're gonna to talk about this. I was like, no, we're not. Nope. <laughs> Um, I'd like to sit down <laughs> and, and sort of, sit down all you want, but, uh, we're going to deal with this. I was like, Oh, all right. You know what? Like I'll, I'll, do, I'll deal with it. And so I'm, I sit down and I feel prompted by the Lord to just kind of, you know, cast my cares uh, upon the feet of Jesus and, and start lifting these people up in prayer. And so I do. And immediately the Lord takes me into a vision. And uh, it was the strangest thing. Uh, there was a huge dining table. And I was on one side of it, and I kind of looked up, and across the table are, are the people I have divisions with. And I had this feeling. I was, I was uneasy. I was like, why, why are they here? Um, I, I, ju- I just couldn't understand. And I didn't literally see Jesus, but... Uh, you know, my spirit checked with whoever this person was. Obviously, Jesus walked in the room, and he sat at the head of the table, and he placed a, a platter of food down, and he spoke these words. He said, welcome to my table. And I was like, whoo, whoa, what does that mean? And the Lord just spoke to me and, and just said, you, you've been carrying the weight for far too long. And friends, this is the first word I want to I wanna speak to us. If we have divisions in our life, if we have reconciliation we need, uh, if, there's, if there's divisions in our, our personal life and even the church, 
Matthew 11 reminds us that, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. But I want to remind you what, what it says before he gets to that. He says, come to me. And many of us have not come to him. And he was checking me even in that moment. He said, you're doing it all on your own. And we weren't made to do this on our own. That's why we need to be of the same mind and same judgment on the same foundational doctrine. Because when we all realize, I'm broken, I'm in need of a sinner, okay, oh, the, the, we realize it's a level playing field. And we go, yeah, we're all broken and we all cause division. And so the reality is, is we all need to come to Jesus and we need to realize that we can't do it on our own. Guys, the spirit of God is within you so that you can walk just as the disciples walked in the presence of Jesus so that you can walk in the spirit just as if Jesus was with you so that you can look more like him. He is your crutch. Lean on him. Proverbs says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Don't do it on your own. And the second thing he was reminding me of was it, it's not my table. Mm-hmm. And I was reminded of Romans 8 when he said that. It's the, it's the verse that says, if our God is for us, who could be against us? Yeah. And we sang that song last week. If our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? You know, we like to, we really like to take that verse personally. Because he's even in that vision, sitting at that table across from people that I don't necessarily want to be across from, when he says, this is my table, well, God, you're for me, so why are these people at my table? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, God's not just for you. Yeah. He's for us. So when you have division in your life, Seeking reconciliation is not just so that you can be reconciled, but it's so that we're all together reconciled. Yeah. See, we, 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 we get upset and we go, Jesus has to be upset about that. Right. Jesus has to be on my side with this one. And guys, don't get me wrong. There's situations where we have been wronged and we're blameless in that. But the heart of the Father and what we don't want to accept is the heart of the Father is still for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because what happens is, is when we get in quarrels, when we lead to division, we actually end up demonizing the, the creation of God yeah. a, a, across from us. And we actually end up going, you're the enemy. And I did this, right? Those people in my, in my mind, I said, these people are my enemies. But the reality is they're not my enemy. The, the, the war is waged against, not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities. And, and the person across from me is not my enemy. Yes, hurt has been caused. Yes, reconciliation needs to happen. Work has to be put in. But that person is not my enemy. They're, they're worth the cross just as much as I am. And so... What we do in division is we end, up, we end up saying, you're not worthy of it. We end up going, you know what, I'm desperately in need of this. But there's a sad truth here, is that when we are so, if my God is for me, who could be against me? What, what we fail to remember is that we may be on the other side of someone's table, begging for God's grace and mercy in the situation. Yep. Just as the other person may be. And so reconciliation, again, is a two-way street. It's hard work. It's not easy. But even when we talk about denominations, God is not just calling for reconciliation in just your personal life. God wants reconciliation in the Global Sea Church. Amen. And this is why Miguel so well spoke on partiality. This is why we need to honor the differences in our churches, whether it's ethnicity differences, whether it's musical differences, whether it's preaching styles, no matter what it is. As long as we are of the same mind and same judgment, we should honor one another. Man, I've experienced people in my life who, I mean, so I grew up playing in 
in gospel churches playing piano. And I remember, you know, people looking at me and going, most of the time it was in good terms. It was like, man, you don't sound white. That's awesome. And the reverse of that is like, what, I sound white? Like, we should honor each other. We should, we should honor the expression. And, and many of us, we, we go, oh, no, that's, that's, like, that's their music or that's their preaching. And that's their style. Guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remind you of something really, really simple. You want to know why you should have no divisions? I'm going to let you know something. When you get to heaven, there's no division. And you better realize there's going to be a lot of diversity. There's going to be a lot of different expressions. And Jesus and the Father and the Spirit love it. Because guess what? There's no, there's no Baptist on the corner in heaven. There's no, there's no Pentecostal down the street in heaven. There, there's one church. There's a spotless bride that the, the bridegroom is coming for. And so why do I harp a little bit on the denomination aspect? Well, we should prepare ourselves to be the spotless bride so that there are no divisions among us, so that we can walk in and we can walk boldly to the throne of grace and say, man, I love just all of you. I love everything that you've created, O Lord. Because we get partial about creation, (laughs) really, and we go, I know you created that, Lord, but, like, I don't like that. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. Let there be no divisions among you. Be of the same mind and say, judgment. Let's all be about the foundational truths of the gospel. From there, let's honor one another. Let's love one another in our different expressions and our different beautiful things, uh, whether it's church life or, or personal life. Um, and so I'm going to get off my soapbox on that. Uh, but this is, this is tough, right, because we're, we're sitting here saying, man, if if divisions are happening and the heart of the Father is reconciliation, what does that look like in my life? Because for some of us in this room, uh, you're in a situation where if, if reconciliation is a two-way street, how do, you, how do you receive reconciliation when another person doesn't want reconciliation? How do you receive reconciliation when you have an abuser and that abuser is still abusing you? We have some three kind of ways I want to talk about this. And the first is, you reconciled to Christ. The ministry of reconciliation. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians and he'll later talk about it in Ephesians 5. Is that before anything, we must remember, as I like to say, that the, the hill of Calvary is level. That we have a God who levels the playing field, that we're, we are all sinners. We are all come from the brokenness of, of Adam and Eve. None of you in here are God in the flesh, uh, so you're not perfect. Uh, we are not a perfect church, and we all have brokenness. And we all, whether we like it or not, have caused a division or been a part of a division or been a part of, a part of sin patterns in our life. And we all need Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected for us. And so the ministry of reconciliation is realizing that through the the sin sin of Adam and Eve is that we were separated from from this Eden with the Father, this indwelling with the Father, knowing that we could walk in the cool of the day with the Father in, in reality. Um, and that it was heaven on earth, essentially, and what God will restore after Jesus comes back. And so what we see is that because of that separation, we needed to be reconciled to God. And so we have a reconciler named Jesus who, by the cross and his death and resurrection, reconciled us to the Father. And so the first understanding is that we all first must be reconciled to the Father through Jesus. And then we know our foundational truth, that Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. And that's how we find reconciliation. Secondly, there's many unique situations in this world. Relationships are complex. And so if you're desiring reconciliation and you're actively in pursuit 
The first step is not reconciliation. Reconciliation is the long road with a person. But if that's not possible, and you're sitting here going, well, if I can't seek reconciliation, am am, am I in the will of God? Am I chasing after the Father's heart? Yeah, seek first forgiveness. See, the reality is, is a lot of times we want to we wanna just let our emotions sweep under the rug. And we go, you know, that hurt me. I'm, you know what? Forget everybody. Forget it all. Forget, forget it. I'm done. And we come with this hardened heart. And, and Isaiah reminds us that Jesus would, uh, the Father, Son, and Spirit would give us a heart of flesh and, and not a heart of stone. And so... Instead of hardening our heart first to even walk towards the door of reconciliation, even if it's not possible, is to walk towards forgiveness. To understand that you can ask the Lord, even if you can't even be in that person's presence, even if you can't meet with that person because of certain situations, say, Lord, I need forgiveness in my own heart first. I need you to help me forgive this person so that I can even, I can be free. So that I don't even hold them from forgiveness. Because Jesus is very clear that if, if, uh, if, if you, you don't forgive, you can hold someone from forgiveness. And so let's be people uh, who look like Jesus and forgive freely because he freely forgave you. And so we forgive and we say, Lord, I need your help. I need to, to forgive this person, even if there's not reconciliation. Walking towards forgiveness. And so, no, you're not outside of the will of God if there's people in your life that you may never have reconciliation with. But you can at least start with forgiveness so that that if the door of reconciliation were to be opened by the Lord, at least your heart is ready. Um, And so secondly, is is just reconciliation with, with people you can reconcile with. See, one of the important things about the quarrels piece is that we let things simmer a little bit too long as people. We're not honest with how we feel. I'm guilty of this myself. We let things tick by, whether it's at work and you see a coworker do something, and you're like, that really irritates me. And that coworker does that same thing routinely every week. And by month three, you're like, what are you doing? Are you serious? And that person's like, what happened? What did I do to you? It's like, you didn't talk about it. You didn't even say anything about what was frustrating you. And so it's just sitting in you. It's festering. And so when we have quarrels, when we, when we have division and we need to reconcile, especially with people in our lives, and we're going to seek that out, first we have to be honest with each other. Whether we have we have offended someone or they have offended us and so we need to be active a two-way street of reconciliation to say I'm going to own my part and you're going to own your part and then a part of that is largely if if in this room you you have been a part of division and you've actually caused division I'm going to call you up today go seek that person out Go seek out the person you've had divisions with and own your part. Listen, I get it. We all want to point the finger. We all want to blame. But the heart of God is not to point fingers. It's to get to the problem and have reconciliation and to see see unity. And get me, friends, reconciliation is a long process, and it does not mean that someone is reconciled to the same place in your life. That doesn't always mean that. It could be that that person is just, there is unity at once, and we're all of the same mind and same agreement, but the reality is we're not, we're not going to be friends anymore. That's a long road. We need to work on trust. But hear me. Hear me. The heart of the Father is that we would walk these hard roads together to reconcile to one another. And some of us may sit here and go, like, I don't think that's possible. Try. Take a step forward. First forgive, and then ask the Lord, ask, please, ask the Holy Spirit in wisdom in situations, what is the be- next, best step, nest, next best step? 
Our God is alive. He speaks to us. And he cares about your relationships on earth. And so ask the Lord and say, man, what, what do I need to do in this moment? Because the truth is, for a situation that you feel may never have reconciliation, the truth is that if you put your hope, faith, trust in Jesus Christ, and you give that situation to him, you may see a reconciliation that you think is impossible. Because our God is the God of impossibility. And so seek reconciliation.